Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, good evening. We greet you today in our uh, Libra Solar Festival webinar. I, uh, my name is Alexander, and I greeting you on the behalf of the 2025 Initiative Coordination Group. And we can begin our work today. And I give the microphone to Wendy uh, Glaubitz to, to lead us into short alignment. Wendy. Good morning, everyone, um, or afternoon as it may be. Um, we are we will begin now with a an alignment. Uh, let's begin with an aspect of uh, preparation, where we become physically relaxed and as comfortable as possible, allowing our breath to come rhythmically. and feeling a sense of relax relaxation moving through our whole body. And we now become emotionally calm and serene, allowing the body to become very quiet until a noticeable serenity is flowing throughout the feeling nature. And now clear the mind of all thoughts, but remain mentally poised and alert. Let us bring our awareness up to the consciousness in the Ajna, realizing now that we are alert and mentally poised. And visualize the physical, emotional, and mental aspects of ourself coming together as a single integrated unit in the Ajna. And let us raise our focus of attention through the force of our deep aspiration toward the soul and identify with the soul. And as a soul, we extend our identification to the new group of world servers. Who link hierarchy and humanity. And as a group, we project a line of light towards the spiritual hierarchy of the planet, the planetary heart. And we visualize it reaching the ashrams of the masters and the Christ at the heart of the hierarchy. And maintaining our alignment to the soul, the new group of world servers, the hierarchy, and the Christ, let us prepare ourselves 
for today's webinar. Thank you, Wendy. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And in this time of Libra alignment, we will talk today about the topic of restorative justice and the inner innate call to balance this moment of systemic change and justice. And we have two distinctive guests today, and I have an honor to introduce them. Uh, Dot Maver uh, is an educator and peace builder whose keynote is inspiring cooperation on behalf of the common good. Her work in education, politics, and grassroots community organizing is focused on creating the conditions for a culture of peace, living in harmonious relationship with self others and all life and originally we announced that uh, our second guest would be molly rowan leach but she's uh, got sick and we got lucky uh, that uh, jeffrey uh, weisberg an executive director of the river phoenix center of peace building uh, I had a chance to join us today and uh, uh, Jeffrey uh, Weisberg um, has designed, developed and implemented a wide range of programs and services in Gainesville, Florida and throughout the United States. His work with youth includes peer mediation, juvenile diversion programs, youth empowerment and coming of uh, age programs. Uh, Jeffrey serves as a Florida certified state mediator and mediates cases involving juvenile offenders, family disputes, and small business conflicts. In addition, Jeffrey is using the restorative practice to support the Department of Juvenile Justice, the court system, schools, and communities to bolster alternative to the punishment model. He is a founding member of the Peace Alliance and has served on the board for eight years. He believes that by training and empowering both youth and adults to learn and practice vital communication skills, we not only create greater connections with others, but we can de-escalate conflict for a safer and more productive outcome. Um, so Dot and Jeffrey, thank you very much for joining us today. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank Alexander. You and thank you. Yeah, and thank you, Wendy, for that lovely alignment. So today, uh, Jeffrey and I are going to share uh, some thoughts. We'll set context first uh, based on the astrology of the moment in the flow of this Libran energy. And then you're in for a treat as Jeffrey shares the work uh, that actually uh, I have been blessed to work with Jeffrey and his wife Hart and uh, the Phoenix family in developing the infrastructure and founding the River Phoenix Center for Peace Building over these past three years. So we'll hear about that in this work. So joy is a special wisdom at this moment in time uh, for all of us uh, as we are in the midst of actually a very challenging crisis point on the planet and I have just returned from Scotland and the Findhorn New Story Summit a gathering of close to 400 people from 56 countries and a very diverse group representing all sectors of society and as I was coming back on the on the, well, the two airplanes and trains and everything else, I found myself just sending heartfelt gratitude to this 2025 initiative and the coordination group 
for providing the impetus and the sacred container to call us together periodically like this to really intentionally work with the energies of the moment on behalf of the greater good. So thank you. Thank you to the entire team. So while I was there at Fintorn, I saw a lovely necklace uh, by St. Justin representing October. An oval silver charm with a slanted line and three cross hash lines. The tree, reed and alder, meaning growth and good health. Inner direction, a unity of purpose and will. The ability to adapt and modify a situation, mediating a balance. That's so library, yes? We modify, qualify, and adapt, aligned with seeking equilibrium, always. The gathering at Fintorn was intense and deeply moving as we challenged ourselves to be together in new ways, all the while realizing and bumping into the limitations of the present system. We are solutionaries. I love that term. Everyone agreed that it's time to seek what we want and what works on behalf of the common good, rather than fighting against the prevailing system or trying to fix what is no longer working. And there was a beautiful intergenerational focus, including a youth council where in circle youth shared their pain and concerns around being either glorified, too much pressure to save the world, or dismissed. And yet wisdom is found among all of us in community in these times. So three takeaways from the week in Scotland with this group of uh, leading thinkers and activists and global solutionaries one, healing emerged as a common core theme, healing ourselves and our relationships with others and with all life, including this beautiful planet we all call home. Then we will be free to live the new story. Well, the new ancient story. Two, we realized we have more questions than answers right now and that it is important to be asking the right or best questions. Although I must say there were many solutions shared on-the-ground initiatives that are working in locales all over the world. So number three is the fact that we are already living the new story. And I'll just give two quick examples. In Mexico, a bill was recently passed naming Mother Earth as a sacred being with rights. Bolivia is likely next. And eco-villages, hundreds of them around the world, are focused on health and meeting needs and sustainability through organic agriculture. This ties directly to Libra, with a focus on the science of right human relationship. And Libra rules peace consciousness and peace education. We are defining peace as living in right or harmonious relationship with self, others, and all life. And let us take note that peace is not the goal. Peace is the natural outcome of the will to good, and good will is love in action. So as we are in the flow of this Libra full moon, here we are in the midst of an all systems breakdown on the planet. We know that the word through holds the key for understanding this next phase for humanity. Harmony through conflict gives a hint, and Jeffrey will share more about that in a minute. Today we will share about one of the significant shifts occurring on the planet in an already emerging all systems breakthrough. That is restorative justice. One of my learnings in the past three years, and it's really a confirmation of something that we know, I saw it in action, experienced it with the River Phoenix Center for Peace Building, is that community actions and organizing can lead to shifting attitudes and behavior. And thus we experience a shift in cultural norms. A shift in cultural norms leads to policy change. Governance by group or community choice and decision making is powerful transformative change. It's lasting change. Change that is not forced upon society. Rather, society chooses. In Gainesville, Florida, we found that by bringing at-risk youth and police together in dialogue circles, following separate trainings with a focus on social-emotional skills, 
along with offering restorative justice as a diversion for offenders, the attitudes and behaviors began to shift. Today, restorative justice is law enforcement policy and is offered as a choice within the criminal justice system. There are two clear examples of these cultural shifts in the world today that relate specifically to the energies of Libra. The first, marriage equality. It is all about love, period. And local to global policy change is on the heels of massive outcries from humanity in support of choosing whom you wish to partner with and marry, regardless of orientation. And second, restorative justice. A shift from punitive to restorative, ultimately taking group responsibility for addressing harm and coming to resolution that meets the needs of all concerned. A way of addressing and repairing harm in circle with community. And Jeffrey will talk about the four questions. Libra rules our subjective and spiritual life, and the emphasis of this sign is a focus on human attainment through achieving the point of balance. Libra is ruled by Venus, Uranus, and Saturn, and is all about balance and equilibrium, inner and outer, spirit and matter, soul and personality. And Libra is focused on the areas of law, sex, and money. So there you have it. Thus we have Venus, a loving, wise approach, to Uranus, utilizing the fire of refinement, often in sudden and sometimes shocking ways, recreating, reforming, re-anythinging in the areas of law, sex, and money, leading to Saturn, building forms embodying the inner reality of spirit expressing through matter. I'm mindful of Helena Blavatsky and uh, the quote, we are all familiar with spirit is matter at its highest and matter is spirit at its lowest. It's all one. In Libra we deal with choice. Let choice be made. With decision I choose the way which leads between the two great lines of force. And as we now turn to one of the great examples of outpicturing of the science of right human relationship through law through balancing the scales of justice with loving understanding in the spirit of cooperation, James O.D. in his book Cultivating Peace says it so well. Restorative justice arises from a deep sense that both the injury and responsibility for it are collectively experienced. It offers both victims and offenders a chance to grow and in so doing helps interrupt the transmission of wounding. And Sharon Deep shares with us her wisdom through the astrology of the moment. Libra energies incline us to find respite in our soul, to choose the values to live by, creating balanced relationships up and down, from side to side, north, south, east, west, over and beyond and within. We are headed in that direction with the north node in Libra, while at the same time we are being called to integrate our pioneering past with that of identifying ourselves more readily as global citizens. We see things differently from that perspective. We may even be inclined to expect our leaders to end their State of the Union addresses with God bless the world. Our decisions, national, state, local, community, group, family, personal, are to be based upon the greatest good for the greatest number. We're becoming more aware of the greater whole which changes the narrative in our lives, choosing different values to live by, having the eventual effect of transforming outer structures, Pluto and Capricorn, restorative, Aries, justice, Libra, is the underlying current of the energies available to us. Interesting that oppositions call for synthesis, and when that happens, it is so powerful. So we have Aries, the forces of restoration, and Libra, justice, balancing the scales, in opposition, calling for that powerful synthesis we call restorative justice. 
and now it is a joy to turn the mic over to Jeffrey Weisberg, Executive Director of the River Phoenix Center for Peace Building, who is an outstanding peace builder and shaper of cultural norms through his empowering work in the field of restorative justice. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Dot and Wendy and Alexander and, and all those who are listening throughout from throughout the world. This is very exciting. And yes, this was a last minute request from Dot, but I'm thrilled to be on the, the call with you folks. And um, this is a special time of year for me, uh, and, and in my life, my birthday is October 15th, which I think is such a magical day for some reason. And also, uh, I'm turning 50 years old this year, so it just feels very, very significant to be moving uh, ever more into my life's work and my life's mission. And um, the the form that has emerged over the last few years has uh, taken the in the shape of the River Phoenix Center for Peace Building that my wife and I originally uh, conceived of and founded, and then Dot Maver joined us as our executive director for about two and a half years. Um, so. Um, I just want to share a little bit of, of our story uh, as a center and as a developing project and then share some of the programs that we deliver and particularly talk about the restorative justice component. Um, so we um, had our roots really in uh, an organization called the Peace Alliance. And one of the primary focuses of that organization was to pass legislation for a U.S. cabinet-level Department of Peace that would um, research, facilitate, and implement best and next practices of violence prevention and intervention, both domestically and internationally. And uh, for those of you who could probably imagine that it's a huge task to actually create a cabinet level in the U.S. government. So there was a point where um, my wife and I got a little bit frustrated with going on that trajectory and said, let's take these principles and bring them into a local community, our community here in Gainesville, Florida, and establish a, a center that's goal is to help to embed and focalize and coordinate these best and next practices of prevention, intervention, and healing from violence and conflict. And what we've discovered is that um, there is a profound need and desire for this work. And, um, and that the doors have been opening largely because I believe that we are, and I love that word that you, you brought back, uh, dot solutionaries. I've never heard it. I love it. I'm going to use it because we are solution oriented um, in our approach. We're not a anti-war organization. We're a pro-peace. So when we go into conversations with the state attorney's office and the, the police department and the Department of Juvenile Justice, what we're emphasizing are strategies that have been proven or that seem common sense and acknowledging the contribution and the good work that these human beings are endeavoring to, to produce and to fulfill and um, often limited within the structures of those entities and institutions. And we found just this huge relief on so many of these players to say, we need help. We cannot arrest our way out of this problem. We cannot keep punishing, and we need to um, call upon the community and other resources to support and, and implement some of these strategies. And, um, and so we provide different programs and services to the community um, that focus on what we believe is our niche and a fundamental starting place of conflict which is interpersonal relationships. Those dynamics uh, and positions that people take in conflict um, 
there are ways to transform them. And particularly what we recognize and, and utilize is uh, compassionate communication, active listening, and reframing um, from a negative perspective to one of possibility and outcome. What do you want out of this situation? And that's, again, that solution-oriented approach. Rather than being caught in the drama triangle of victim, perpetrator, rescuer, we flip it and we say, what do you want? So the opposite of victim is creator and helping people to really identify what it is that they want to manifest and what are some new strategies that they could implement and get trained in to fulfill that, that vision and that desire. And so there's five key areas that, that we are focused on um, in the work of RPCP, River Phoenix Center for Peace Building. As I mentioned, the first is, is healthy communication because we want everyone to learn to resolve conflict through healthy communication in relationship. And we believe that that is a fundamental component in breaking the cycle of violence. So we do a communication and self-esteem series for eight weeks where youth who are on probation or in schools go through this, and then the last class they teach it back to their families and probation officers and community members, and giving them some of these vital skills and tools to um, move through these challenging dynamics of relationship. And then another area um, is leadership development. We take kids who have referrals um, and teach them these, these different principles of conflict resolution and restorative justice and healthy communication and teaching police officers and probation officers and school teachers all of these vital components. I often call it the underbelly of conflict because that vulnerability, that humanizing of who we each are, I think is often missed in our criminal justice system that tends to demonize and, um, and continue the, the, the perpetration upon one another. So how do we recognize our humanity and the vulnerability and, and bring a new consciousness to the people who do cause harm that, that conflict doesn't happen in a vacuum, that we have these influences and factors that contribute to people's behavior. And then another area that Dot mentioned briefly is what we call disproportionate minority contact, that unfortunately black and brown youth um, are disproportionately affected and have interaction with the criminal justice system. And what we found is the more contact that they have with the criminal justice system, the deeper they go into that and often lead to prison and jail and, and then that cycle just continues. And so what we're doing is training police officers and African-American youth to break down stereotypes and biases and understand adolescent brain development. Why do these young people act this way? Why are they, um, um, you know, why do they run away or why do they fight? Or, and that's the, the reaction in the brain. And so we train them on different ways to de-escalate these interactions and conflicts. And the police chief is very, very progressive, and he wants all 350 of his officers to go through this training. And we've seen just tremendous change in thinking and perceptions and attitudes between the African-American and black and brown population with law enforcement and law enforcement with these young people. And that translates as they go out into communities through what's called community policing to interact and build relationships in neighborhoods. And then finally, and before I speak with, about the restorative justice, our final project that we're working on intensely right now is to become what's known as a trauma responsive community. That trauma is um, a, a huge factor in people's development and their ability to cope and to uh, learn and that if we can identify the different causes of trauma 
and um, different interventions and preventions and healing modalities, if all of these agencies and entities and, and players are on the same page and collaborating, coordinating these efforts, that we feel like we will have a fundamental shift in thinking and behavior on all levels in the school, the criminal justice system, at, uh, in the mental health communities, and so forth. So uh, keep your eyes open for that because we are having a conference down here in November 14th about that and moving forward. And we're not the, the first ones doing this, but um, it's a very important component in this arc of peace building is how do we support our community in that way. And then finally, I want to um, go into a little depth of, of restorative justice in our... And Jeffrey, Jeffrey, this is Dot. As you do that, Alexander... Can we show the River Phoenix website uh, as Jeffrey shares about restorative justice? Thanks. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Don. So, restorative justice um, is a theory of justice that it actually is very ancient. It has its roots in indigenous cultures that when there was a conflict or a harm done between two or more people in a tribe or a community, the whole community and, and tribe would come together as a council to address what happened. And it's very, very different. It's, it's just completely opposite in our method of dealing with conflict where we, um, the state steps in and represents the person who received the harm and often doesn't even give that person a voice or an opportunity for deeper healing and understanding. So restorative justice um, brings together both of those key parties and also uh, the, the community and the family and different resources of support that can um, address four fundamental questions. We, we come together and we ask, what happened? What, what is, what's the story? What's the data? Um, and for everybody to be able to share from their perspective what happened. And then secondly, what was the impact or the harm on you, on us? And so often people are, are quite blind to the impact that our behaviors have on other people. And that can be from our, our words to our actions, to our behaviors and how it affects another person or other animals or the environment and the world itself. So it's very important for people to be reflected um, of how this has impacted me and us and, and we as a community. And then thirdly, how might I or we repair this harm and these consequences? What can I do to, to make this right? How can I come back into relationship with you, with myself, with others? That the work that we do in the criminal justice system, it, it's just staggering the pain and the guilt and the shame that men and women carry for the choices that they've made, often just at an impulse. It could be literally a split-second decision that changes everyone's lives. And so how can we bring these people and those of us who have caused harm back into relationship and connection. And then finally, how can we prevent this from happening in the future? And to develop a strategy and an agreement, actually a written agreement um, of behaviors and actions and intentions that will prevent this uh, from happening and bring in a sense of accountability as well as safety in the relationship and within the community. Because, you know, why we send people away to prison is the ultimately, I believe, some people's version of justice, but also it has a lot to do with our need for safety. So, um, uh, Dominic Barter, I don't have it right here, but he has a quote that speaks to this, which is that, um, with, with that if we go towards conflict, oh, actually I have it right here. He says, 
um, rather than being dangerous, conflict holds within it vital messages regarding unmet needs and areas of necessary change. Given this understanding, safety is increased not by avoiding conflict, but by moving toward it with the intention of hearing the messages within. And that's from Dominic Barter, who is a re restorative justice uh, trainer and master. Uh, he lives in uh, Brazil. Um, so what we've found um, is that the doors are, are opening more and more for this kind of program. As a matter of fact, we just got a grant for two years to work with young people who have been charged with domestic battery. So they've hit or threatened their parent or guardian or sibling. And it's so exciting to be working with these young people and to hear their stories and what's driving that behavior. Because unmet needs drive behavior. And if we can help distinguish and determine what those needs are and then embed and implement new strategies within that family system, uh, we are interrupting that cycle of violence. And there's many other examples that I can give, but I, I think I'll, I'll end at this point just to say that we are developing a model here in Gainesville and been working on that for the last couple of years that can be translated into other communities around the world. Our vision is to have these centers um, training, you know, hundreds and thousands of practitioners and academics and people working in institutions to embed some of these principles of restorative justice and compassion and empathy and understanding that needs drive behavior to really inform mm. uh, new policy thinking and behavior. Mm. And with that, I think I'll, I'll pause and turn it back to you, Dot. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey, for the work that you're doing and for your capacity to articulate it so well with such clarity and heart. And I'm mindful once again of this group standing in invocatory intention within the Libran energies uh, and the science of right human relationship. And that is really for humanity at this moment in time such a keynote and harmonious relationship with all life. So thank you. It's and a reminder also that Libra is a uniquely, well along with Gemini, but uniquely a sign of human attainment. And so as we stand in this intention, I wonder, Alexander, as you prepare to invite others on the call to uh, sound the note, to share, to inquire, whatever, would you play the public service announcement, the PSA that's on the home page of the River Phoenix Center for Peace Building website? Yes, Dot. Um, that's, Thank you. Number that would, three. Number three. Okay, so that would be experiment for us to um, show video through this platform. So please bear with us if it's not going to play perfectly. Uh, some reason you won't be able to see it. Uh, there is a link on the chat window of uh, your control panel, which you can yeah. uh, launch and watch it independently on your screen. Oops.
Mm. Thank you. And Alexander, thank you for your perseverance with the technology on behalf of us all. <laughs> here, here. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. So over to you, Alexander, to open it up as you, uh, as you indicated. Um, yes, so we at uh, this moment would like to open the floor for uh, comments and sharing so questions from the audience. And um, you can do it uh, either using the function of raise your hand. It's a, a button on your control panel. Uh, a, we will unmute you. By default, everyone is muted on the call besides the panelists for technical reasons. So we will unmute you that you could speak. Or you could leave your comments on the chat uh, section of the control panel. But of course, we would prefer to hear your voice. And so far, I see a Christine Moore uh, uh, who raised her hand. And I will unmute. And Christine, I see you muted yourself on your side. So please, if you want to speak, unmute yourself. It's a microphone uh, button on your control panel. And um, while we wait, and maybe like uh, Christine, while you will figure out how to unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. So I would be happy to um, re make a request of Jeffrey. Uh, Jeffrey, there's so much going on for you with your work and restorative justice. Would you share uh, one of the, the themes that's emerging, even one of the case stories, if you uh, can, with us, at, by example, uh, for how it's working, and even the victim advocacy. There are some wonderful stories emerging from your work. Sure. Um... You know, we we are actually um, doing a case right now, uh, a murder case, and we're going to go up next week to a prison in Georgia. A man, uh, three men, came down um, from from Georgia into Florida and murdered seven people, and this this was 38 years ago. And the sister of the man who was killed, um, she approached us and she said, I need some help. I'm, I'm still living with this, this pain and this deep, deep hurt and these questions unanswered. And I want to meet this man who killed my brother. And so we've been working with her for actually over a year now. And... Um, had several different sessions for her to be able to just share and process what is it has been like for her and her family over these years and um, and her courage to be able to go face to face with this man um, and be able to uh, discover you know why did he do this what was he thinking was this intentional do you realize the impact and this man who was killed had two babies at the time, and now they're grown up, and they're very challenged, actually, from this incident. And also, this man who did the, the harm, he's willing to be in the hot seat, essentially, and to, um, and to hear this woman's truth, and to also share how this has impacted him. He was like 19 years old at the time. So restorative justice can be used in many, many different uh, examples and, and situations from those extreme of genocide, rape, murder, all the way down to simple petty theft and bullying. But it's, it's such a what, – what I think I see is that this concept of unmet needs driving behavior, mm -hmm. being able to be um, – understood and revealed and considered in this kind of dialogue and setting uh, has a fundamental ability to transform these kinds of painful traumatic incidences into huge victories of understanding and compassion, reconnection, and potentially even at times forgiveness 
helping people to let go of burdens that they've been carrying literally for years and years. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's powerful. Uh, powerful healing goes on, and I know we talk about uh, prevention, intervention, and healing, and yet it seems that healing is at the heart of the matter right now on the planet. And in, in terms of humanity shifting from, uh, perhaps the greatest shift going on on the planet is from me to we, this recognition of group and our personal responsibility and accountability within group. And of course, Libra being all about relationships. So, yeah, thank you. Alexander, is, is Christine there? Yes, I am. Great. Oh, good. Hi, Christine. Thank you. Uh, this actually, uh, Dot, is leading to my point today because I have been on other sites uh, regarding brain and behavior and I have some experience in healing the amygdala because this is where, in fact, all this trauma is being held in the body. Yes. So I'd like to address that. Uh, Jeffrey has not told me, told us at this juncture, um, if there was any intervention by psychologists with drugs, which of course I am opposed to. Mm -hmm. However, what I am going to address, because I have spoken with what I call natural healers, the diet, and particularly minerals in the diet, address behavior, especially for adolescents. I'm also practicing aromatherapy and I find that the highest frequency purest oils will cross the blood-brain barrier unlike most drugs. Mm -hmm. I am working with a naturopath who has neuro-emotional remedies that will in fact address a lot of what you have experienced not only with the perpetrator but now I understand that the families cannot release this trauma and this is a life misspent for both. Mm. Yeah, thank you for putting that into the circle Christine. One of the most powerful uh, ongoing spontaneous things that happened at the New Story Summit in Scotland last week was ritual after ritual of grief and grief healing. And there were folks there uh, who spoke of heart math, which you're probably familiar with uh, as you talk about the amygdala and the fact that uh, brain science research has now proven that it's uh, nurture not nature. We are not hardwired. Our brain is not hardwired and in fact it's basically only drugs and uh, fetal alcohol syndrome that can uh, turn the tide on that, make that so that it appears we are hardwired. So yeah, thank you for that input. Jeffrey, did you want to address that? Yeah, I also appreciate that. You know, it is, a, I believe that m most of these um, efforts need to consider or or incorporate uh, a multidisciplinary approach mm. and you know when we're talking about healing from from trauma that the the number one cause of, of trauma in the research that I have done is neglect and um, even people who have seen seen violence or experienced it directly themselves it still is not nearly to the degree of, of what it is for people to experience neglect. And, and so from that perspective, it's about coming back into connection in a safe way, realignment, and restorative practices and many of these other components of peace building from our perspective, I believe, are really aimed at how do we help meet that fundamental need of connection mm -hmm. and safe and to be seen, known, and understood. 
and that that in, in and of itself is a profound healing modality for uh, creating right conditions within and throughout. Uh, but I, I appreciate your comment too about different modalities and mm -hmm. natural remedies of helping to support people in their healing through trauma. Thank you. I also share your frustration, Jeffrey, with the lack of Department of Peace because I here in Michigan had attempted to help Marianne Williamson along with many others, of course. Uh, and, you know, I still have hope. I hope you do, too. <laughs> there you go, yes, Christine. Yes, I do. And let us yes. mention that the Global Alliance for Ministries and Infrastructures for Peace is alive and well and now 56 countries strong. That's gamip.org, G-A-M-I-P.org. And there are ministries for peace on the planet at this point. So, and there are lots of infrastructures for peace, and uh, the USA and some of our work, Christine, uh, over these years has helped inspire some of that. So, thank you for that as well. Thank you all. Perfect Lima Libra timing. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Uh, Dud, I have a question of my own. Okay. Uh, it's I got interesting observation like while listening to your uh, presentation and introduction which was r brilliant I realized that I hear you and it all sounds right but still doesn't get to my brain how the justice system can function differently so I'm kind of like wired my brain is wired that that's how the system is and that's how it's just like <laughs> I don't want to say will be of course like we work that it to change it but can you just tell us how the program actually works I, I, I we've talked about it before so I know for, like from your uh, uh, stories mm -hmm. that it's like quite unique so to give us just like like some of the mechanism how this process happens that we okay. could visualize how we could change this system Yes, so I'll, be, I'll begin that process and then I'm going to pass the baton almost immediately to Jeffrey because he and Hart are doing it every day on the ground now in Gainesville, Florida and it's being picked up by the state and as Jeffrey said throughout the country as well. Uh, in fact, Colorado, the state of Colorado now offers restorative justice as a choice in the United States. So what happens is there's an offense. Uh, something is done that is uh, violent uh, and or offensive to others. And instead of that person being arrested, or put in a detention center or a jail or whatever, they are referred to a restorative justice uh, person or group. And that's one of the main things we've talked about over the years. The, it, the need is, as in Longmont, Colorado, to have a restorative justice center or group in the community which River Phoenix Center for Peace Building is. And then you begin to identify, the, based on uh, the first question that Jeffrey proposed of four, what happened, who the players are, and who needs to be in that circle. And so Jeffrey, do you want to describe what actually happens, in interviews and setting up for success, coming into circle, and who's there? Yeah, sure, but but I want to just back up for a moment because when we first started, we I had known this woman in the state attorney's office. She's the director of victim services, and Hart Dot and myself went to meet with her, and for the first 20, 30 minutes, she was very nice, but she basically said, no, this is not going to happen, but we were so clear and deeply grounded in, in, in this work and in our intention that eventually she pushed her chair back and she says, all right, you know what? We're going to start referring cases to you. Can you start next month? And, and I said, like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the reason I bring that up is because in any of these major changes that, that we are um, involved in, um, it has everything to do with right relationship, yeah. that we approach these people with the highest level of, of respect. We may have differences. We may not like certain strategies, um, but the kind of 
care and respect and consideration that we, we feel and that we give to them is ultimately what has opened these doors for us to then prove that these are what's called next or best practices. And so once we have the listening and the go-ahead and the endorsement for us to do these programs, then it becomes embedded into the system. And an example of that is our communication and self-esteem class now is required um, for some youth by the judge, the, the juvenile judge, as part of their community service and their probation time that they have certain sanctions. And they would rather these young people go learn some communication skills and conflict resolution as opposed to picking up trash or, or painting or something of that nature. And, um, and they actually like this so much that they give the kids a 100% bonus uh, for their, their community service hours. So for every hour they're in class, they get two hours. And so that, that's just one example. And another, like I said, this grant that we got from a, from this lady who likes our work and she believes in it, she wrote us a grant for us to be the providers. And now as that continues to get embedded, it will become more widely used and known within the community. And so if you're thinking of trying to bring some of these best and next practices into your community, your agency, and so forth, um, we, we certainly could do some coaching, but the, the short story is it has everything to do with how you approach and the kind of relationship that you foster and build. And when they feel like they can trust you and you have some competence, you know what you're talking about. Just good intentions is often not enough. You do need to have some, um, some credibility and some competence in what you're trying to, to do. Um, so that combined is, is to us our strategy and what seems to be working. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jeffrey. Yeah, and then for the actual circle, if when something happens, bringing people together, the whoever the person is, the offender, the victim, all the people in the community who have been impacted, and everyone gets to answer those four questions of what happened, how did it impact. You know, what you know what harm was done how do we repair the harm and how do we ensure it doesn't happen again and then a, a contract is developed basically an agreement among that group and everyone agrees what they will do and we have to say that a, a serious seriously high percentage of the time it really is restorative and resolution prevails so long as everyone is willing and do do you have any statistics, any like results uh, of your programs that like proven success? Yeah, we we do. But uh, a program that's that we are modeled after for restorative justice has been doing this for about fifteen years. It's mm -hmm. called communityconferencing.org. Communityconferencing.org, and they're out of Baltimore, Maryland, and. They have a whole uh, display on their website or some resources about the statistics. But one of the statistics that they have is out of all the cases that they get, 98% of them uh, come up with an agreement. And 95% of those agreements are fulfilled. And, and what that translates to mean is that these people are getting resources there is a much, much lower rate of recidivism and the community experience and healing within families is dramatically increased and they have lots of great data that can, can uh, help you see how this can translate. Yeah, and so we're really uh, enga engaged in engaging citizen productivity. You know, through this whole process and really restoring balance in our society so that everyone takes personal responsibility and then is given the opportunity to offer their unique contribution on behalf of the common good. And in a way, it doesn't get more library than that. 
So I'm noticing that we're at the top of the hour, Alexander, and thinking that it's time to move into the third phase. Uh, yes, we we almost there. Just I want to read one comment coming from Elisa Mendonca from uh, Brazil, and a, sh a short question from her. Uh, she writes, "That's a great experience of walk in the path of forgiveness via mm -hmm. the understanding and acceptance of ourselves, the group we belong, and the powerful experience of Dot and Jeffrey. Things that all over the planet." That's one of the most significant steps we all have to understand. Many thanks in this. It, it is really a joy. And a short question from her. It will be interesting to have from Jeffrey uh, the name of Dominic, who he mentioned, uh, who lives in Brazil, to share with friends which works uh, on that also, or to try to find groups like that. Um, can, Jeffrey, could you repeat the name of uh, Dominic? And yeah. if you know if there yeah. are any groups in Brazil, or maybe like you can refer to some site where people could find if there are such groups exist in their countries, because we have people on this call from different countries present. Yes, fantastic, Alexander. So his name, and thank you so much for that comment, by the way. That's so beautiful, and, and your support and championing. So this man's name, and he is such a soul brother. He's so beautiful and deep. His name is Dominic, D-O-M-I-N-I-C, Dominic Barter, B-A-R-T as in Tom, E-R, Barter. Dominic Barter, so you can look him up on um, Google him and you'll find his work and his website, articles, mm -hmm. videos, uh, some of the, the programs that he's involved in around the world. He does do trainings. Um, so he would be a great resource, especially for you in Brazil. I bet you there's people that know him who are involved in this kind of work. Absolutely, especially in uh, Rio. And uh, uh, the website is restorativecircles.org. And you can see it now on the screen. Yeah. And it's on your chat window. Thank you, Eliza. So as we, Alexander, shall we now? Shift? Yes, yes, okay. please. So as we shift into the third phase, and Jeffrey, thank you for being part of this conversation, this dialogue. It's always so inspiring to stand with you in the fire of love. Absolutely. Uh, so I, I actually have to sign off because I'm going to teach a class right now to young girls in a detention center. So I will bring this conversation and the blessings of it to them. These are beautiful young women who uh, are being locked up for six to nine months, but they're be being given some of these new tools. So thank you all for this opportunity. Dot, oh, forever and, and ever we are in this together, and Wendy mm -hmm. and Alexander and all those who have joined this call. Thank you and blessings. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So as we Prepare now for our meditation together. There are two, two things that uh, Jeffrey and I wanted to share. and One of them has to do with Libra and spiritual compromise, which is one of the keynotes of Libra. And it was only, I shouldn't say only, it's a giveaway uh, in terms of age, right? But it's, it was only about 20 years ago that it occurred to me to look up the etymology of the word compromise. Calm, with, and of course, promise. And so we promise with to be spirit. And so I want to share this quote from Dane Rudjar addressing this Libran quality of spiritual compromise from the perspective of at one mint with its opposite sign, Aries. This type of social adaptation should not be such as to divert or muddy the flow of the release of power. It should not alter the quality of the projected images or cloud the vision they convey. This is a difficult task of discrimination, to be adaptable, yet to retain the purity and total integrity of one's vision and one's ideal, to accept detours 
yet not lose the direction of the goal. To be understandable and acceptable to those who need the spiritual arousal, yet not distort or lower the character of the message. To use the values born of the past, yet not sell short the future to the uncertain present. To be kind to humans, yet uncompromisingly true to the spirit. The individual who is consecrated and true to the spirit acts as the spirit in terms of human needs. And you know, in the labors of Hercules, and a shout out to Bob who's on the call and your wonderful work with the labors of Hercules. The Libran labor is the only one that ends with laughter. And Librans are so energetically filled with laughter and song and dance and, uh, well, speaking from experience, just a, an essential love of life. So we also wanted to close our sharing as we bridge into meditation with a song. How could anyone ever tell you you are anything less than beautiful? How could anyone ever tell you you are less than whole? How could anyone fail to notice that your loving is a miracle? How deeply you're connected to my soul. And that is thanks to Libby Roderick. So now let us prepare to let in the light. At this moment of invocation to stand in group unity, uniting our hearts across distance. Affirming the fact of group fusion and integration within the heart center of the new group of world servers, we sound together. I am one with my group brothers, and all that I have is theirs. May the love which is in my soul pour forth to them. May the strength which is in me lift and aid them. May the thoughts which my soul creates reach and encourage them. We project a line of lighted energy towards Shambhala, the center where the will of God is known. and holding the contemplative mind open to the extraplanetary energies available at this time, we offer ourselves as a group to receive and distribute those energies on behalf of the common good.
in our meditation together. We will step in using the sound of the bowl and step out using the sound of the bowl. As we reflect on the seed thought for Libra, I choose the way which leads between the two great lines of force.
using the creative imagination visualize the energies of light love and the will to good pouring throughout the planet and becoming anchored on earth Refocus the consciousness as a group and together sound the affirmation. In the center of all love I stand. From that center I, the soul, will outward move. From that center I, the one who serves, will work. May the love of the Divine Self be shed abroad in my heart, through my group, and throughout the world. We visualize the downpouring spiritual inflow streaming into humanity through the prepared channel. As the great invocation is sounded, visualize the outpouring of light and love and power through the five planetary inlets, London, Darjeeling, New York, Geneva, Tokyo, irradiating the consciousness of the whole human race. From the point of light, within the mind of God. Let light stream forth into human minds. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into human hearts. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known. Let purpose guide all little human wills, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the human race, let the plan of love and light work out and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love 
and power restore the plan on earth. Oh. Thank you very much, Doug. And thank, thanks to all for your participation and focus in this group effort. We stay connected throughout this period of the full moon. And uh, till next webinar during the Scorpio Solar Festival. And please join our next webinar in the month time. It's going to be on the topic of the new thought form presentation of the wisdom with Jane Parrish Johnson and Wendy Glaubitz Figure. And today's webinar is recorded and will be in the archive section of our website, 2025initiative.org. Thank you.